No. The Lord brought it to my mind when I started talking about God moving sovereignly. I remember well. Back in 93, I believe it was, when we had the building in Belchertown. And we went to New Hampshire for a meeting with the youth group. And the Holy Ghost broke out in the midst of that meeting. And I think it was a overflow, overspray from maybe the Toronto meetings, but we didn't know nothing about Toronto meetings, never heard of them. And that was about the time they started. It was in February, I remember. We drove, I don't need it, but I'm, I'm going to stand up. Um, I remember we drove home in the worst snowstorm from, from Manchester, New Hampshire. But we got home on a Wednesday after, after dealing with 19. We had 19 of us that would, had gone there, youth and probably another four or five hundred in the congregation that were like a bunch of drunks for three days. And we came home, and on Thursday evening, I'll never forget this, we were going to have our regular service, we were being normal, you know. I was being normal. You know, I had all these drunks, and I was the designated driver. You know, somebody's got to stay sober. So we got to church, and I'll never forget the look. We had this kid come at that time. His name was Ed. And I'll never forget, I looked over at Ed, and I said to Ed, why don't you tell us about what happened this weekend? And he stood up and fell over. And it started... And Christ Life Fellowship was like a drunken gathering for about six weeks. And the foolishness of it all was because I didn't know what to do with it. But there are days that I wish God would move again in such a sovereign way. I'll never forget Bob Columbus bringing all of those young ladies from from. Uh, Westfield State and they all were down here and all of a sudden the Spirit of God moved on them and they all fell out all over the place and nobody was touching them or doing anything. Linda Crozier was over against the wall over there and every time she tried to stand up her feet would go out from underneath her and down she would go. Yeah, but I'm expecting God to do something greater than that. I've said this before, every revival that I've ever been around or even heard about, and I'm 80, going on 81. But everyone had an end. I'm looking for something that has no end. That's eternal. And I believe that there are those out there are getting a sensing of what we call and what they call. I don't call it because I'm, it's mostly these young prophetic voices I hear keep talking about a third wave. And I think a third wave is basically what Barry's going to touch when he deals with the Feast of Tabernacles. That's the third dimension. The church has never really experienced the fullness of the third dimension. I'm, I'm convinced, and I have been for 25 years, that the church is still dealing with the Day of Atonement. Because it was after the day in the evening, at 6 o'clock in the evening of the Day of Atonement, that the trumpets were blown that introduced us to the Feast of Tabernacles and began a feast that was a feast of celebration. 
and perfection and completion. And I believe that that's, that's yet to be experienced in the church. But the other day, um, I, I got this. Um, we, we ran, when we were in Florida this summer, we came across the prophetic ministry out of Fort Walton Beach. Um, a, guy, a young guy named Ned Merriman. And I became really acquainted with his writings and I'm, I've been impressed with his writings. I'm, I don't give a stamp of approval to everything everybody says. You know, I gotta have it in my spirit. I gotta have it in my heart. But there's a lot of good stuff that's being said. And you got to begin to pray it about. You gotta begin to pray it through. As you know, I've been dealing with this, this aspect of moving on to perfection at the beginning of the year. And I, I'll share a little bit on purpose I've, if i got enough time. Can you wait till 2 o'clock for dinner? I'll, I'll be okay, you know, then if you, you'll do that. Today is Sunday. It's the Lord's Day. Whatever else you got planned, you should cancel. Uh-oh. I just, things got awful quiet right there. Okay, anyway, I received this um, on Thursday or Friday of this past week and didn't think any more about it. I just saved it, shared it on my Facebook page. And then I decided this morning in prayer, I heard the Lord whisper in my spirit and he said, read it to the church. And so I'm going to read this to the church. It's uh, a prophetic voice by the name of Charlie Stamp. Don't know the man. Don't know anything about him. Didn't bother doing any checking. But I read what he wrote. And I said, amen, Lord, I'm all for that. So let me read, okay? Is that all right? I was recently in prayer and was taking, uh, taken up in the spirit. I looked and saw these deep-seated old roots of corruption, and they were in the foundation of the White House. In the vision, the White House appeared to be shaped like a very old tree with its branches withering. And suddenly the hand of the Lord came and pulled it out of the ground. And another White House was put in its place that the roots revealed righteousness and peace. And the hand of the Lord planted it in rich soil, and it began to flourish. Its branches contained beautiful fruit. And as I looked at this tree, it seemed to be an olive tree. I was again lifted up and taken to the House of Representatives the Senate, and the Supreme Court. And where I saw them uprooted as well and replaced with new trees, that their foundations were righteousness and peace. And they too began to flourish and bear fruit and appeared to be olive trees as well with multi-colored fruit. And then I heard the Lord speak. I have extended an olive branch of peace to the United States of America and I will extend Donald Trump's presidency into a second term by the power of my right hand. And what I have done in the White House will happen with every branch of government in the United States for I will pull out corruption and plant trees of righteousness that will bear much fruit even now the ax is laid to the root of these corrupt trees. Every tree that does not bear good fruit will be cut down, pulled out, and thrown into the fire. There will come forth new terms filled with peace. Branches will grow out of righteous roots. The Spirit of the Lord will rest upon America again the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, and the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord will return once again across the land. 
God, if we've ever needed anything, that's it. I'm not being political. I'm not done. I again looked and saw a massive red tsunami coming to America. Suddenly it crashed against the shores and covered the nations. And I thought, no, does this mean disaster will come? And I heard the Lord say, listen to this, I will come to America with another wave of revival. This will be the third wave and will crash against the shores so intensely that the nation will awaken to righteousness again. And I will cover this nation with my blood. Cities will experience the salvation of my hand. I will empower my church to preach the message of the cross. And multitude will, multitudes will run to altars on street corners and stadiums as I cover the nation with the blood of my son from sea to shining sea. And the Lord spoke to me again and said, As a sure sign of these things coming to pass, there will be a wave of conservatives elected during the midterm election in November 2018. That's three weeks from Tuesday. It will be breaking news. They will carry the House and the Senate, and I will uproot, replant, and rebuild the nation. I will tie the three branches of government together, for a person standing alone can be attacked and defeated, but two standing back to back can conquer. Three are even better, for a triple braided cord is not easily broken. I will no longer allow your president to stand on his own. Even now I have called others to come alongside and help bring the nation back from the dead, and they will take their seats in coming days. I saw the House of Representatives stay in the hands of the Republicans and will move to a more conservative position. I could see into the Senate and saw the Republicans gain nine seats. Those that took their place were considerably more conservative than those who had previously been there. I heard the Lord say, yes, nine will be a sign, a sign that righteousness has been birthed in the nation and in the earth. I saw three constitutional conservatives who were appointed to the Supreme Court by the President before 2020. I, have, I was so stirred in my heart at the sight of the nation, it was no longer surviving, it was thriving. Waves of outpouring, renewal, and revival were all around. I saw tangible glory clouds coming down. God will have his way in the coming days here it is, but we must stand to pray it in. Are you ready for it? Are you ready for it? Are you ready for it? I'm ready for transformation. I'm ready for God to sovereignly move in such a way that it upsets our apple cart. Because we pick our own fruit, our own apples, and we decide which way we want to do things. I want to hear God sovereignly move on a church I was thinking when Nikita was teaching Sunday school today, and he's dealing with one of my favorite books, The Hyssop That Springeth Out of the Wall, by a great man. A great man wrote that book, George Warnock. And one of the things I began to realize, he said the thing or the great thing about the about the book, in the book, was to take bitterness out of God's people. I did a quick search while I was sitting in Sunday school. 
on the word bitter and bitterness. And the scriptures over and over again call death bitterness. And I began to realize that bitterness is something that gets in your soul because of how your life has been. I'm going to sit down again. Excuse me, it's Thursday. I'm going to get my chair. Just like Thursday, I'm going to sit down to teach. And uh, one of the things I began to realize about bitterness, there's a, there's a scripture that says, husbands, be not bitter with your wives. In other words, you got the picture. And a thought came to me, if you ever want to be bitter, okay, there's two things to keep from being bitter. Don't get married. And don't pastor a church. Then I heard the Lord say, I took you through those things to teach you not to be bitter. You got to have a heart full of forgiving and love. Because you got lots of reasons to be bitter. Are you listening? And the one thing you don't want to do is die bitter. You don't even want to live bitter. You want to be free from all of that. And you want God. You want God to bring you to a new dimension. Amen. I've got, I've got 20, 23 minutes and I'll quit. Okay. Is that all right? I have to, I have to do something that I've never done before in this aspect. Okay. I believe that if we're going to be overcomers, remember reading your Bible only the overcomers get the benefits. What does that mean? That means that not every believer is an overcomer. They live lives their way. And the one thing they don't overcome is their way of thinking. If God said that we got to bring every thought into captivity to Christ... That means to take on the mind of Christ in every aspect, every area of your life. If you don't have the mind of God, you've not got the glory. Because the glory is the way he thinks. Are you listening? And I shared with you people over and over and over again about the man that refused to put on the wedding garment and he was cast into outer darkness where there was bitterness, wailing and gnashing of teeth. He was not in hell. He was a believer. He was invited to the wedding feast. But there was bitterness. I can put it this way. It was hell to be where he was. But it wasn't the lake of fire. Do you understand? So God gives the overcomer in my Bible. The God gives only the overcomer, not just those who receive Jesus, but those who overcome. He gives the overcomer all the benefits. If you don't agree with me, Read your Bible, see what your Bible says. That's what my Bible says. What Bible do you read? Well, let me see. Uh, right now I got the King James Bible up because it's got the Strong's Concordance with it. But I've been reading every translation I can lay my hands on lately. Okay? Some I like, some I don't like. Some leave out some stuff and some don't. Okay? But the bottom line is, we need to take the whole word 
every aspect of the word. And I've been pressing because I began the year with Hebrews 6 and 1 where it said, let us go on to perfection or maturity or completeness. And to me, that means we got to press through. I know we spend a lot of time when we go into 6 of Hebrews dealing with the, the things. He said, you know, faith without works and all, you know, all that stuff. All that stuff that's listed there. And I, that, that's not where I want to focus. Those are foundational things. Those are the things we ought to build in our lives when we're first believers, like going to church. You don't think there's a problem about going to church? Just come in here on a Thursday and see how many of you are not here. Maybe you're not going to like that, but I'm just telling you how it is. God is after doing things his way. And when you do that, you do it according to his word. And his word says, don't forget the assembling of yourselves together. Even the more as you see the day coming. Okay? So can we talk about the day a little bit? All right? Because... There's so many people got so many theories on eschatology. You know, nothing's going to happen bad. The church, you know, a pastor's prayer meeting I go to, somebody said last Saturday when I was there, he said, yeah, well, before that gets all that bad, the church is going to be out of here. And I thought, where did they find that in the book? Okay. The Bible don't say that. He said, we're going to be caught up to a meeting. Where's the meeting? In the air. The word, it means in the air, in a breathable atmosphere. That's just within 7,000 feet. You get above 7,000 feet and it's hard to breathe. Are you all listening to me? So God has got a day. You know, and I'm, I'm going into 2 Peter 3 because I've been questioned on this. We had people leave this church because I told them that the earth was not going to be burned up. That's not a literal statement. The Bible says our God is a consuming fire. But he isn't the kind of fire that you would go out and pile wood and all that stuff on. He's a different, it's a different kind of fire. Okay? It's a fire that can consume a soul and a spirit. If I go, now next week we're going out here, we're going to have a bonfire. And we can have a heck of a bonfire out here. Okay? We haven't had the fire department here yet, but I wouldn't be a bit surprised there'll be a day. Because we usually burn up all the excess stuff, the branches that fall and all that. We get rid of all that and we have a party when we do it. See? But I want to tell you what, you can burn that. It might burn your flesh, but it can't kill your spirit or your soul. But our God is a consuming fire. Do you understand? It's a different kind of fire altogether. But even if it is, I've got to throw this out there. Even if this statement is literal in here, this statement is literal the key statement is that we're to look for a new heaven and a new earth. And in the writing, Peter compares it to the time of the flood. And what happened with Noah? Noah built an ark to the preservation of humanity. Are you all right? And he was caught up in the flood. Everything was destroyed. But when the flood waters receded, where did they go? They went back to the clouds, the heavens, where they came from. And when the waters receded, what was there? The earth. It wasn't dissolved. Are you listening? And the Bible says... That, you know, I, I, I think if we really look at it really close, we'll find out 
The earth was the same. It was there. Still had volcanoes down in the middle, you know, and still had all of that stuff that goes on and whatever goes on in the earth. Are you listening? But everything that was ungodly, are you listening? Was removed. Are you listening? Okay. I want to read this a little bit and just say a few things because here's where I have gotten to this year. Remember sometime when I came back from uh, our, our Florida party, you know, when I went with the kids and the great grandbabies and all of them to Florida and uh, we came back, the Lord gave me the word about three dimensions, okay? Passion, prayer, and purpose. God has a purpose. It isn't my purpose, it isn't your purpose. My purpose better be lined up with his purpose because if my purpose is not lined up with his purpose, then I'm being, I am allowing myself to be processed in a wrong way. You understand? Um, Nikita talked to us in Sunday school about it when he said about Israel, 40 years in the wilderness, God had a purpose for them. But because they wouldn't listen to the prophet, when he declared what the, what the promised land was like, because of that, he was proving them for 40 years. Think about this. They never had to worry about food. It was there every day. Their clothes never wore out. They didn't have to shower. They didn't stink. Oh, God. How old are you? See, most of you are so modern, you, you gotta have a shower every day or you think nobody will receive you. When I was young, we had to get the bathtub from outside, bring it in the house in the kitchen, fill the pots on the electric stove with water, the big pots, heat them up, and the kids got the bath first, and mom and dad got what was left over. And when that was every Saturday night. And you're all looking at me like, ooh, ooh. You wanna know why? Because our bathroom was 80 feet out the door. And our toilet paper was an old Sears catalog. <laughs> you, you, now listen to me. You're, you're all going, ooh, but Israel was taken care of in the wilderness. Never had a thing to worry about because God was processing them on the way to the promise. What is God doing with the church now? For two days, he's been processing us on the way, but we've come to the doorway of the third day. And God's still processing us. Are you listening? This second epistle, beloved, I now write to you, in both of which I stir up your pure minds by way of remembrance. In other words, they had already been told. that you may be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets and of the commandment of us, the apostles of the Lord and Savior. Excuse me, but I'm hot. Thanks, bud. Knowing that this first there shall come in the last days scoffers, walking after their own lusts and saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. Now, 
I've been accused falsely that I don't believe in the coming of the Lord. Are you all here? We had a prophetic ministry in here last night, a year ago, October. He left here and went home and openly told people, I just was with an older fellow in New England who said he does not believe in the second coming. What I said was, I don't believe it's the second coming. I think it is the physical coming. I believe that in the Bible bears me out that on the day of Pentecost, when the Holy Ghost was poured out, that was the second coming. And he's been coming every day, every moment since then. And not only does he come by himself, he brings the Father with him. That's John 14. Okay? So I'm just clarifying some things. I believe that Jesus will return. But when he comes back, he's not coming back to fix things. If Calvary didn't fix it, it can't get fixed. If Jesus' blood can't fix it, it can't get fixed. For this they are willingly ignorant of, that the word of God, by the word of God, the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of the water and in the water, whereby the world that then was being overflowed with water perished. So he said, the world perished. Okay? Sorry, I didn't mean to do that. The world that then was. This word for world is cosmos. It's the arrangement of things. It's like the decorations on the Christmas tree. It isn't the Christmas tree. It's the decorations on the Christmas tree. So the word that was used here was the culture. The way things were done. You know something? I'm 80 years old, and I just told you the story about our Saturday night bath. That was the culture that was there. That world has passed away. Things are different now. But the Word of God is the same. It does not fit the culture The kingdom word comes into us at this time to adjust us to kingdom culture. It isn't the way you think it is. It's the way he declares it. You are in the process of being adjusted and it's up to you to decide whether you want his adjustment in your life. You got the choice. When you were under Adam, you had no choice. You were driven. But once you've been set free in God, you get the freedom to choose. I'm going to do it his way, or I can find myself out in darkness where there is wailing and gnashing of teeth. What that's all about is they missed their golden opportunity to press on into God. But the heavens and the earth, which are now, by the same word, say same word, are kept in store and reserved under fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. Say, God is judging the world. What is he going to judge them for? Come on, church, talk to me. You ought to know this. 
He's not judging people because they sin. He's judging people because they refuse to accept his offer, his sacrifice, his Lord, his son. That's all the judgment is about. He offers salvation to all. But he declared to us that before I judge the world out there, truth of the matter is, his works are finished from before the foundation of the world. He already has judged it. He's already declared it. He already knows who is and who ain't. Else he couldn't be God. But he leaves it up to us to accept. Are you listening? But the heavens and the earth, which are now by the same word, are kept in store, reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and the perdition, or perdition is a wonderful word. It's apoloa. It means destroying, utter destruction, perishing, ruin, destruction. That's um, Strong's. You want me to do Thayer's or any of the other one? I can go through the whole list of ungodly men. The word judgment in the Greek is krino. It means the mind. But you add the dia, D-I-A, in front of it, and it means through the mind. It's like putting an arrow through an apple. Are you listening? Judgment is God. He's already set what his purpose is. But judgment is through the mind. He's totally trying to convince a lost and dying world. Convince them in the mind that he's right. And his word is like an arrow. Are, are we okay? Okay. It's reserved on the fire against the day of judgment. Can I talk about a day? Is it okay? Y'all here? Yes. How about this? How about this? Because it's going down a little lower in this, in this chapter. A day with the Lord is as a thousand years. So the truth of the matter was, in God's mindset, Jesus went to Calvary the day before yesterday. Are you all set? So is the day of judgment, this is my question to you. I'm going to let you figure this out yourself. Is the day of judgment a 24-hour day, or is it a long period of time? Is God giving the world, the lost world, the opportunity Are you listening? But beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing. That one day if the Lord is as a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. So how long is this period of judgment that God's dealing with you and I? Because he said judgment is first going to begin in God's house. Say, God is working in this house. Come on, right here. Right here. This house. He's trying to get us to make up our mind. Till our thoughts are like his thoughts. Say human thoughts will separate us from the purposes of God. But God will shake us and shake us until everything that's not a him falls off. You know what we want? Oh, make it smooth, Lord. Don't give me no hard times. 
Oh God, I just want to have it my way. I want to do it my way. Remember Israel? 11 day journey to the promised land. Took them 40 years to cross the Sinai, which you can drive across in 15 minutes. I've said this so many times, I think some of you have got dull to hearing. You had two and a half million people and it's 18 inches wide. And they stood side by side. They would have encircled the Sinai for 40 years and they were lost. Think about that. Just think about that. Remember I told you, Willie Hinn told me he was a teenager. He's riding with his uncle. They lived in Tel Aviv. They're riding, he was riding with his uncle and they're going across the Sinai and he said, my uncle turned to me. He said I was about 15, 16 years old. He said my uncle turned to me and said to me, he said, Willie, just think, two and a half million people got lost here for 40 years and we can drive across it in 15 minutes. I believe people can sit in this church and be lost. Have no clue. They're so caught up with self. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long suffering. What's God doing? Say, God is biding time. He's long-suffering to us, word, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Say, what is God doing in my life today? He's trying to get me to repent. That's you. That's me. That's all of us. Oh, I almost ran out of time. I'll make it up to you next week. I'll tell you what we'll do. Okay? After worship, we're going to do communion. Okay? We'll do communion. And then we'll pack up and go out and eat hot dogs. Is that all right? I'll make it up to you. Okay. But the day of the Lord the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night in which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise and the elements shall melt with fervent heat and the earth also shall, and the works that therein shall be burned up. I'm all for that. Maybe you're not, but I'm all for that. I'm all for having heaven on earth. I'm, I'm all for not having separation between heaven and earth any longer. I'm all for heaven being here. Because that was God's design plan from day one. Say, Eve, listen to the serpent. And Adam, listen to Eve. So here's the deal. Listen to God. And don't let anybody rob you of the tree of life. Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought ye to be in holy behavior and God-likeness. Now Peter said that God has given us everything. Everything. Say nothing lacking. He's given us everything that pertains unto life and God-likeness. So my question is, Christ Life Fellowship, what do you need? If everything's been given to you, 
It's in the Holy Ghost. It's been given to you. What do you need? All you need is a decision-making purpose. You need repentance. You say, God, where am I resisting you? He'll show you. I have to cry out all the time, God, where's, where, where am I, where am I, where's my resistance? What is, what is it that I'm not doing that I can't hear you every moment? Say, God, I want all these elements in my life to dissolve and melt away. That's what it's all about. Because I'm going to tell you where the new heaven is. It's going to come right here. And the new earth is in this physical body. That's what immortality is. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heaven and a new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness. Therefore, beloved, seeing that you look for such things, be diligent that you're found in him in peace and without spot and blameless. I'm not going to, I'm not going to read anymore. I'm not going to do anymore. I felt this is what the Lord said to me to bring to this house today. I've never had, I, I, I don't, I don't, I don't like, I like to talk about all the good things. But the good thing is, if we obey, if we set aside our mindsets, if we repent of the way we think, and allow him, because we can get all caught up in all kinds of activity, you know, doing this, doing that. And we become great doers. God's not interested as much in doing as he is being. Are you listening? And that means, Lord, I got to become what you called me to be. I got to be a full expression of who you are. Till we all arrive. Say all of us. All of us. We are all together lovely. Not a bunch of individuals. We are all together lovely. Till we all arrive to the measure of the stature of the fullness of the Christ. Listen to me. You have no idea how big the Christ is. Jesus is the head of that body. But there are no ways to really tell exactly how big the body really is. Are you listening? But the process is right here in this third chapter. God wants to burn up in you every hyper-spiritual thing you got, so-called heavenly stuff. Because I'm going to tell you what godly fire does. It burns up the wood, the hay, and the stubble, and it purifies the precious things. Say, God, come to my life. Purify the precious things. Burn up the wood, the hay, the stubble, Lord, that I might be a vessel unto honor in Jesus' name. I love you all. See you all. Don't forget, prayer time Wednesday night. Next Thursday, we'll be here again. Ladies meeting on Tuesday at 10 o'clock. And next Sunday, next Sunday, we are going to...